So this next video is concentrating on what the nucleus is like and nuclear processes. Now, just over 100 years ago or so, no one really knew what the atom looked like. They knew that they existed now, and they knew that electrons existed, but they didn't know about protons and neutrons, and they didn't know about how the electron orbited around the nucleus. Now, someone called JJ Thompson, who discovered the electron, thought that the atom looked a bit like a plum pudding. Now, I don't really know how many of you know about plum puddings. They're kind of like Christmas puddings. Now, his model was called the plum pudding model because he thought that the atom was a round kind of ball, like this, with lots of negative electrons kind of in there, like currents. That's what he said. They were like currents running through a plum pudding. So there were lots of negative electrons in the plum pudding. And then they knew that atoms are neutral, so there must be something positive there to balance out that negative. And he thought that this kind of the, the pudding, the cake bit of the plum pudding, so not the currants or the plums even, was positive. So we had a positive cake with lots of negative currents in there. And overall, that meant, meant it was neutral. This is what they thought the atom looked like. Now, we know that that's not the case. We know that it's a nuclear model. Just to really quickly recap, we know that there are negative electrons orbiting around a positive nucleus and in that nucleus we've got some neutrons and we've got some protons and you see them in blue some positive protons now there's something wrong with this atom as in there's not enough electrons so I'm going to draw another shell now we know that in the first shell of electrons we can only have two so these next two electrons are going to go around in the next shell and I think of these I think of it like the solar system where the nucleus is the sun and then we have the orbits of the planets. So these two are like Mercury, then we go on to Venus, then we go on to Earth, etc. So they move out each time. So this is the one that's accepted nowadays. And there's a reason for that. And that's because someone called Ernest Rutherford did an experiment where he expected to get results that would verify this model, but then actually got some results that showed this was wrong. And he came up with this idea instead. Now, his experiment was really quite simple considering what it found out. He had a setup that looked something like this. Now, this here, I might be able to put this in the box, I don't think. This is an alpha source. Remember, alpha is radiation that's positive. It's a positive radiation. And it's surrounded by lead. Now, we know that lead, has that got two hours in? I'm not completely sure. Surrounded by lead. We know that lead blocks radiation. It blocks gamma radiation, so it definitely blocks alpha radiation. And that means there's just a little gap here where the alpha radiation could come out. So the alpha radiation was being fired at this thing here. Now this is a sheet of gold foil and it was so thin that it was literally only a couple of atoms thick. It was two or three atoms thick. It was really, really, really thin foil. So we can think of it as just kind of one or two layers of atoms. So if you think of that, it's kind of this kind of thing. And this is my, we'll see that more on the next page. So a really thin piece of gold foil. Then there were two more components to this. This all took place in an evacuated chamber, evacuated chamber, i.e. a vacuum. So the only molecules that were in there, the only things that were in there were the alpha particles and the gold foil. There was no air to kind of get in the way. And the final thing he needed was this, which is a radiation detector. Now, what Rutherford did was that he fired his alpha particles through the gold foil and then move this detector around to see where the radiation was picked up. And if the plum pudding model was correct, so that's lots of neutral atoms in a long row, remember something like this, that's, sorry that's completely wrong because that's not negative, some neutral atoms in a row like this, then the alpha particles would pass straight through. And so he expected to find all of his radiation here. The plum pudding model would detect it all here. All the radiation, all the alpha particles would be detected here. Now, that's not what he found. He found something different. He found, I'm going to draw it with an orange pen, that most radiation was here. And this is actual results, just so we remember what colour we are. So most of the radiation was found here where we expected, but a little bit was found here, a little bit of radiation. 
And that shouldn't happen if the plump in the model is correct, because it would all just pass through, it wouldn't be deflected anyway. Now as we moved around past this point, around here, he found that a tiny bit was fine here. So we were still getting radiation here. How did that happen when we were firing in that way? And finally, although this wasn't really possible, if you could get rid of this lead bit, he'd see that you would even get radiation the tiniest bit, tiniest, I'll have to put that there, found here. So he found that radiation was detected all the way around this circle. Most was here, but decreasing amounts were found as we get around the circle, which was not what the plum pudding model was meant to show. So he knew that his model must be wrong. And he came up with an idea about why this happened. So I've got here my picture of my gold foil. So this is the gold foil. And we can see that it's only here two atoms thick. Now remember my alpha particles are coming from here. My alpha source is over here. Okay. Now the vast majority was f were found on this side of the gold foil going straight through. Now that happened if we have an alpha particle that travels through an atom, that's not a very good line actually, but still we'll carry on, that doesn't really travel too closely to a nucleus of an atom, so if you ignore that bit. This atom, um, this alpha particle here, doesn't travel too closely, it travels in the gaps between nuclei. Now remember, alpha particles are positive and nuclei are positive. So if it gets too close, it's going to veer off, it's going to be attracted or deflected by it. Okay, not different, not attracted, refract, reflected by it. So, repelled is even the right word I'm looking for. So um, the south particle has travelled straight through, it's not been deflected, no deflection. And to Rutherford, that was fine. Okay, we could cope with that. Now some, I was going to do an orange, passed a bit too close to a nucleus. So it's this one here. And remember, this is positive, so it gets pushed away. Because two positives are going to repel. So this is positive, that's positive, it's going to repel each other. Okay? And this alpha particle gets deflected. Now this deflection shows there must be a positive part. In the um, atom. There must be a positive part of the atom. So it's not spread out like we saw in the plum pudding model. It's not all spread out like this, the positive. There must be a positive part in the atom. Now, only a few, one in a hundred say did this, not many. 99%, 90% did this. I'm going to write them in numbers just so you remember. 90% do that. About, say, 5% do this. Now, one in every thousand does something really unusual. And that happens when it heads straight for an a nucleus, a nucleus of an atom and it's reflected back, okay? So one in a thousand, probably more than that actually, were reflected straight back, repelled straight back. My pen's breaking. And that showed that this positive part that we talked about must be tiny. tiny positive bit because if only one in a thousand are being repelled then there must be lots of space where the other 999 can get through. So this alpha particle reflects straight, if it hits straight on that nucleus then it's repelled straight back because it's repelled, remember, positive and a positive repel. So Rutherford's explanation of all of this was that it can't be the plum pudding model. The atom must have a tiny positive centre and then surrounding that we, he worked out that the electrons must be orbiting around that and the electrons are much much smaller than the um, positive centre. He also knew from that the electrons had to go around singularly whereas the positive centre, the nucleus, actually usually had a much bigger positive charge than the, the singular electron, um, negative charge of the electrons but don't worry too much about that. But from this he got the nuclear model and that's the one that we use. So it's important to know about this experiment. You don't have to know about it in too much detail, but you need to know that there's a reason, the setup of it, some of the results, and that he's the, this is the reason that we believe that this is now the correct model for atoms from empirical evidence. 
Now, from that, we need to go on to something called the strong force. Now, if I have two protons, and my red pen's kind of breaking, but I'll try and use it because that's what I've been using for protons. If I have two protons near each other, they're going to repel. Because a positive and a positive don't like each other. They don't want to be next to each other. They hate each other. They don't want to be anywhere near each other. So they're going to repel. But if I think about a nucleus, so maybe a carbon nucleus, I've got six protons in a very small space. From five there, six. So in a carbon nucleus, I've got six protons in a very small space. There's some neutrons there to balance it out. But they hate they hate each other, they don't want to be there, so this is a carbon nucleus. So how is this happening? Well, we worked out from this that there had to be something called another force. This is called electrostatic repulsion. And then this force, there must be something bigger that can overcome this. So electrostatic repulsion must be overcome by something else. And we call this, inside the nucleus, the strong force. Okay, the strong force holds the nucleus together. And it's stronger in the nucleus than the electrostatic force, the electrostatic repulsion. Okay? Now once you get past the nucleus, the strong force doesn't actually really exist. It's a short range force, we say. So once you get to here, it doesn't have an effect. It only, it only has an effect on a very, very small distance. But the strong force, all you need to know is that it holds nuclei together because it makes sure those protons don't push themselves apart, they're not repelled, they're attracted instead. Now, the next thing we need to know about, the strong force is important, we're going to talk about nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion manages to overcome electrostatic repulsion and use the strong force and that's all we need to know about it. And the first thing we need to look at here is this. So, there's two particles here. One here, this is an atom called hydrogen. It's got one proton and one electron. We've looked at this a few times. This one is called helium. It's got two protons and two electrons. Now, the difference between the hydrogen and the helium atom isn't really that much. If I had two hydrogens, I would basically have a helium atom. If I put two hydrogen atoms together, so two protons and two electrons, I would basically have a helium atom, as long as I added two neutrons. Now, that is exactly what fusion is. It's adding two hydrogen atoms together to get a helium. It needs a bit of help to do that. It can't just happen spontaneously because we know that two protons, two nuclei will not want to get too close together because they're going to repel. However, if they get close enough, the strong force can take over and then they can join. And that's what nuclear fusion is. Now for this to happen, it has to be two things. Really, really hot. And really, really high pressure this means that the particles have got more energy so they're more likely to overcome that force. So it only happens, this is what happens, nuclear fusion happens in the sun. It is hydrogen fusing together to make helium. But as you can see, we can't just add the two together, we have to have two neutrons. Now we talked about isotopes of hydrogen before in the last video. Now an isotope is an atom that's got the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons and that's where these two neutrons come from. There were two different types, there were two different isotopes of hydrogen apart from hydrogen we talked about. They were deuterium and tritium. Now deuterium has one proton and one neutron. Tritium has one proton and two neutrons. I'm going to colour them in again just so they're a bit easier to see. So my protons are red and my neutrons will be green. I'm just colour them in here. So deuterium's got one proton and one neutron. Tritium's got two pro one proton and two neutrons. Now, if we can force those close enough together, like this, if you look here, this now looks a bit more like hydrogen nuclei. So we can force them close enough together, they can overcome the electrostatic force, and they can fuse together. Okay, And they can make, we can get out of that, a helium nucleus, which is two protons and two neutrons. This is helium. We can also get out of that a spare neutron, because if you look there, there's three neutrons there and only two there, so one neutron. And also from this, we get lots and lots of energy. Now this happens because of 
Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared and we'll talk about that in one second. But if I join this and, I, and this side, this is my before and this is my after. I start with deuterium and tritium, I end with helium and one neutron and some energy. Now the mass of the deuterium and the tritium on this side, the total mass on this side is not equal to the total mass on this side. Okay, total mass on this side is actually bigger. Okay. There's more mass on this side than this side. Even though there's the same number of particles, because of the force they've had to overcome, and much, much higher level than you need to know, the mass is different on the two sides. So this has got more mass than this one. Now, that extra mass is converted into energy. That extra mass becomes energy. And it becomes that via Einstein's really famous equation, E equals mc squared. Where E stands for energy, M stands for mass, and C stands for the speed of light. So the amount of energy that you get depends on the amount of mass times the speed of light squared. And remember the speed of light is something like 300,000 million, 300 million meters per second, okay? So we're squaring that, so it's a huge number. So a tiny difference in mass or a tiny conversion of mass into energy gives you a huge amount of energy. And this is how the sun works, this is where the sun shines, this is where we get all the energy from the sun from. It's from nuclear fusion. And we need to know that it happens because E equals mc squared and there's a difference in mass between the two. So that's everything you really need to know so far about nuclei. Next we're going to go on to some maths behind uh, radioactivity, so some nuclear decay equations and half-lives. And then we'll talk more about nuclear fission, which is a really important part of nuclear power. So hopefully that made some sense.